good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Randa Corey. I am a board certified dermatologist and I practice at Kaiser Permanente in Northern Virginia. I am honored and delighted to be joined today by my two incredible colleagues, Dr. Jamie Goldberg and Dr. Brittany Hefner. And we are really excited to be talking with you today about strategies to build your perfect skincare routine. As a dermatologist, I get so many questions from patients about what is healthy skin and how do we achieve it. And everyone's skin is unique, and so this is a really important topic to discuss. So let's get started by having our panelists introduce themselves. Dr. Goldberg, would you like to start? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jamie Goldberg. I am a board certified dermatologist with Permanente Medicine, and I practice up in Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Brittany Hefner. I practice in Northern Virginia and I work for Kaiser Permanente. Everyone, we are so looking forward to your questions. If you're watching live, please post them and feel free to comment on Facebook. And we are just gonna dive right in. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about why skincare is important to our overall health. We often think of our hair, our skin, our nails as external ways to see kind of what's going on inside. Poets say the eyes are the window to the soul. Dermatologists say the skin is the window to your health. And the skin is also has a very long memory. The skin is like an elephant, never forgets. So all of the choices that we make in our youth, even as children, as far as the skincare products we choose in our sun exposure, really inform a lot of what our skin is going to look like as we age. Um, so we're going to start by just talking about establishing a skincare routine. And these are basic principles that we as dermatologists hold dear, regardless of your age or your skin type. Um, Dr. Hefner, will you share a little bit about um, your tips for establishing general good skin health? Sure. Um, so first of all, a skincare routine does not have to be anything that's complicated. Um, main things for any type of skin, um, I would recommend a couple of different things. So the, the basics would be a cleanser um, and for some people a toner and a moisturizer. Um, so after, apply, after using the cleanser, um, you would do the, a toner or a moisturizer, then you can apply your makeup. Um, so there's a lot of questions that can come from that. There are many different cleansers available. Um, you can pick from a classic bar soap, you can pick from um, a wash, a lipid-free cleanser, um, cleansing creams, exfoliants. There's a lot of products out there on the market, so it's hard to know exactly what you should choose. Um, we can dive into that a little bit later on, um, but that's um, something we'll talk about and you send in your questions. Um, in general, uh, toners are not necessary for everyone. Um, Back in the day, astringents were made to uh, remove any soap residue that came from our, our lye-based soaps and hard water, um, which we don't use anymore. So toners are not truly necessary for, for most people out there. Um, if you are using um, like a cleansing cream or if you're using a lipid-free cleanser, then you might want to use an astringent or a toner um, to remove some of the, the residue left behind from those. Um, if you're one of those people that has more dry, sensitive skin, you can still use a toner. Um, I would just suggest using one that's made for, for sensitive skin, um, one that contains moisturizers such as propylene glycol, um, glycerin, um, something like that. Um, and then uh, moisturizers, so there's a lot of different options out there, um, you know, for your face, if you're more... Uh, someone that's acne prone, you want to stick to something that is non-communogenic, look for that on the label. Um, if you are someone that has uh, more dry skin, more prone to eczema, you might want to stick to something that is more cream-based or, or a greasy ointment to moisturize, moisturize your skin. Um, so we can segue into a little bit about, you know, how often should I wash my face? Um, how often should I moisturize? Does it really matter what products I use? Uh, I think, Jamie, you were going to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. 
Um, so as far as how often to wash your face, I think that differs a little bit about um, each different person and your different skin types. And you want to try to figure out whether you have more dry skin, more sensitive skin, or more oily skin or acne prone skin. On average, we would recommend washing your face twice a day, at least once or twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, particularly in the evening to wash away any makeup or residue from throughout the day. Just like your hair and the rest of the area of your body, you can overwash. So if you use harsh cleansers and wash multiple times during the day, if you're scrubbing really hard, you can really over dry out your skin. So if you do have dry sensitive skin, take it easy. Use a gentle cleanser. Use your hands to wash and try not to use anything harsh or abrasive to scrub, which can strip down some of our natural oils. Um, and if you have oily or acne prone skin, then you can afford to wash your face a little bit more frequently, um, morning, evening, and perhaps during the day after activities, if you're sweating, playing sports and things like that. It's always a good idea to moisturize your skin, and I think we'll talk about this in a little bit, incorporating a daily moisturizer, particularly with sunscreen every morning. Um, if you do have that oily or acne prone, prone skin, you want to pick a moisturizer that's non-comedogenic, which means it's oil free and it's not going to clog your pores. And if you have dry or sensitive skin, you just want to make sure that you are incorporating a moisturizer every day to help um, replenish your skin with those natural moisturizers. Dr. Goldberg, these are all such great points. Um, I have a question here about those who wear makeup. Um, and you're talking about preserving our skin barrier. Our skin barrier is so important. And when we, we use those nubby, scrubby cleansers or uh, manual exfoliants, we can really damage that skin barrier. But sometimes for our makeup wearers, um, you can almost feel like you need to do that, you know, like you need to scrub the skin, exfoliate the skin, use a harsher toner in order to remove that makeup. Um, and that's really not the case. Would you like to talk about some some good skincare tips for our makeup wearers to remove that makeup while still preserving our skin barrier? Yeah, definitely. So um, there's certainly no need to avoid makeup. Um, you just want to make sure in the evenings after you are putting products on your skin, you're washing your skin. Um, in order to remove them. We usually recommend using lukewarm water and using just your hands to rinse. If you do feel like um, you need to scrub or use a product to remove makeup, then use a washcloth with some lukewarm water on it. Again, like Dr. Corey said, harsh um, exfoliants or scrubs can um, really, you know, you think you're wiping away the moisture, but you're really stripping down the natural oil and causing some irritation and sensitivity. So again, if you need to, uh, I usually recommend just a plain um, soft washcloth. Put your, put your cleanser on that washcloth and giving, you know, a very gentle, very gentle cleaning. Absolutely. That's such a great tip. And I'll add that sometimes we forget that like dissolves like. So even if you're wearing a kind of a thicker, heavier makeup, there are oil-based cleansers, which seems counterintuitive, right? Because you think it's kind of thick and greasy. And so you need something harsh to scrub it off. You really don't. Even some of these balm-based cleansers, even if you have a more acne-prone skin type, can be great as a first wash to remove those products. And then you can just do a gentle cleanser um, afterwards. Now, if you're using water-based products, as Dr. Goldberg said, you might not even need to do that. Just a little bit of gentle cleanser in your fingertips or a gentle washcloth is fine. But if you are wearing something a little thicker, you got a little fancy, those oil-based cleansers are a great way to do kind of a pre-cleanse or a double cleanse to remove that before you do your gentle cleansing. But um, harsh and scrubby is never the answer. <laughs> Um, so kind of in thinking about that, one thing that we think about with skincare is the evolution of our skin. The needs of one person's skin can be so different from the needs of another. And even for our own skin health journey, what we need in our teenage years is so different from kind of what we may need moving on. Um, I would just want to talk a little bit about how generally our skin changes as we age. And as a disclaimer, with everything that we're mentioning today, everyone is different. So if what we're talking about today doesn't seem like it really matches your journey, um, please reach out to your doctor to talk about it. The information that we're giving today is meant to just kind of be a general overview, um, but don't feel as if, if what we're saying doesn't really um, match your journey, doesn't resonate with you, we're here to answer your questions. In general, when we are young, we are pretty greasy. 
So starting in our teenage years is going to be kind of our maximum oil production. It's also going to seem as if our skin really bounces back, both literally and metaphorically. So you can get a sunburn, that sunburn will peel, and all of a sudden it seems like everything is right back to the way it was. Your skin can be oily, it can withstand kind of those harsher, more scrubbing ingredients. It seems like, like there's just a lot of reserve there. But really what's happening is your skin is internalizing all of the choices that we make. And as we move throughout our life, the skin generally dries out. Not for everyone, but for most people, your skin is going to be kind of peak greasy in your teenage years. And then in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond, your skin is going to dry out and its needs are going to change. Same thing with all of that sun damage that seems like it's doing nothing in our youth, in our childhood. All of those texture changes, those fine lines, that crepey skin, the brown spots, and then um, the skin cancers and precancers that we see, these are a result of ultraviolet radiation that we're getting in our younger days. So if you get a sunburn on vacation and you come back um, when you are in your 50s and we find a skin cancer two weeks later, it likely had nothing to do with that sunburn. It's likely the cumulative sun damage that happened from a really young age. So making healthy skincare choices like prioritizing protecting your skin from ultraviolet radiation and um, making sure we protect that skin barrier are super important. Um, and in thinking about that, we're gonna start talking about selecting a few of those specific products. I see we had a question come in talking about um, melasma specifically, but we can talk about just hyperpigmentation, discoloration in general. Um, Dr. Hefner, do you want to talk a little bit about choosing skincare products kind of for those phases in life, maybe touching on the oily acne prone skin, dry skin, and then ingredients that can address kind of the melasma hyperpigmentation family? Yeah, so um, let's talk a little bit about the, the hyperpigmentation. Um, so, you know, that's a something that people can deal with in um, you know, even your teenage years after having acne. Um, you know, as we get a little bit older, we get some freckles and some sunspots. Um, you can also have some melasma that develops. Um, there has been more evidence in the past few years for using sunscreens that contain iron oxide. Um, these are the sunscreens that are uh, tinted. So, um, you know, not every sunscreen will actually write that the ingredient is iron oxide. So basically, uh, there's a couple out there. Um, there is some evidence now that we can develop hyperpigmentation, not only from the sun, but also from our TV screens and from our computers and um, our light device light-based devices. Um, so very important to apply those sunscreens every day, even if you're not going to be outside. Um, in terms of you know other things that you can look out for, I think a lot of people ask about vitamin C. Is that helpful for my hyperpigmentation? Um, can that help with my melasma? Um, vitamin C has been very popular in the past few years. Um, the, it's a little tricky. So so vitamin C, and I know I know Randa um, talk, likes to talk about vitamin C too, so she can chime in, but um, it's acidic. So um, the manufacturers of our vitamin C products have to be a little bit tricky about how um, they formulate uh, these serums. Um, it's acidic, so anything that you put on your face that's acidic can be really irritating. That makes us have to apply um, a, a serum. Um, most of the products out there, um, they, there, there are different derivatives of vitamin C. You want to look for one that actually has ascorbic acid. Um, that is proven to be the, the most beneficial for reducing hyperpigmentation. Um, other things that might be helpful, uh, so you could uh, try azelaic acid. You can find that in some over-the-counter products that can also help with your hyperpigmentation. Also great for acne-prone skin. Um, so azelaic acid can help with your rosacea, with your acne, um, hyperpigmentation. So it's a kind of a one-for-all type of um, ingredient to look out for. Um, are there anything, any other ingredients that you would add, Randa? I think that um, this is great. So to summarize, you're gonna um, 
do a gentle cleanser, regardless of your skin type, you're going to start your day with a gentle cleanser. And then you're going to use whatever active you'd like. If you are oily, you can look for things like benzoyl peroxide, salicylic acid, um, which are things that are usually marketed to treat acne. But even if you don't have acne, they can be used to dry the skin. And then even if you have oily skin, you still want to use a moisturizer. This is going to help regulate your skin's oil production and keep you from getting too dry and overproducing oil to compensate. And then your last step is always going to be sunscreen. And I know everyone gets so tired of dermatologists harping on sunscreen, but the truth of the matter is that if you are not protecting your skin from the sun, you are honestly wasting your precious time, effort, and money doing everything else. Because let's say you have melasma, for example, and you're investing in azelaic acid or a fabulous prescription topical or seeing a cosmetic dermatologist for chemical peels, and then you're not wearing your sunscreen. You are going to be right back where you started, maybe even worse. So sunscreen is absolutely crucial to protect not only our skin, but also our investment. It's a lot of work to make your skin look the way you like. And then in the evening, you're going to gentle cleanse again. And then you can also use an active for nighttime. As Brittany touched on, a lot of the things in this category, vitamin C uh, is ascorbic acid, azelaic acid is obviously an acid, salicylic acid, again, obviously an acid, glycolic acids, um, beta hydroxy acids, all of those things that are in the acid family, we like to think of those as daytime products. They work really well in the daytime. They layer beautifully under sunscreen. They tend to give a little bit of a brightening effect. Um, so they're really nice to use in daytime. At nighttime is a great time to use your basic products. And I know in the popular connotation, basic is now something negative, but it's actually something really great for your skin and chemistry. These would be things like retinols, retinals, or retinoids. Um, that are just great to kind of help with skin cell turnover, which can help with a number of concerns, getting rid of acne, um, over time changing the texture of the skin and addressing hyperpigmentation. So it's a great product for really all ages to get in the habit of using. And then you're almost certainly gonna need a moisturizer over that because they do tend to be a little bit drying, especially when used over time. Now, um, Knowing all of that and knowing that our key ingredient, our MVP, our starting lineup of all times are sunscreen, we want to talk a little bit more about sunscreen and sunscreen ingredients, especially the ones that are safe for babies or toddlers. Brittany, you were mentioning about um, iron oxide being an interesting new ingredient that we're talking about a lot with sunscreens. Can you touch a little bit on what sun protection products we recommend for babies or children? Yeah, so um, one of the questions I get asked frequently is, um, you know, is is this what sunscreen should I use for my for my baby? Um, there's a lot of different products out there that are marketed, you know, for for babies specifically. Um, I typically tell my patients that that's not necessary to use a, a specific baby product. Um, often these contain excessive ingredients, um, preservatives um, that can actually be more irritating to your, your kid's skin. Um, so main points, um, I would look out for anything that's, uh, I would look for anything that's fragrance free, dye free, you don't want to irritate your, um, your kid's skin, they tend to be more sensitive. Um, in terms of sunscreens particular, particularly, um, you know, beyond the age of six months, um, mineral sunscreens are most easily tolerated compared to chemical sunscreens. So the, the mineral sunscreens would be your tinted, your titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, um, or your physical blockers. Um, the caveat with those is that they do tend to go on kind of white, um, take a while to rub in, but they are very effective. They are very broad spectrum. Um, you can also use chemical sunscreens. Um, that's also fine. I will say, um, you know, one thing that's great for my kids is putting them in a, uh, a UPF um, swimsuit. So, so something that is long sleeve, long pants, then you don't have to worry about continuing to apply sunscreen um, when you're out enjoying the beach. Um, a hat is always good too. So um, it's a little bit easier to, to put them in one of those UPF uh, swimsuits to, to, and that's usually what I recommend. Um, but yeah, mineral sunscreens, chemical sunscreens, um, be under the age of six months, um, you really want to limit time in the sun for the kids. So um, 
Do you think, does that answer the, the question? Absolutely, those are such great tips. So generally we say for sunscreens, mineral sunscreens, you could think of like a liquid shirt. You're gonna put them on and they're going to start blocking the sun right away. They're gonna sit on top of the skin rather than sinking into the skin and creating a chemical reaction that actually reflects the light. So that's the main difference. A mineral sunscreen is gonna go on and physically block ultraviolet radiation. It's gonna start working right away. A chemical sunscreen is going to sink into the skin and is going to take a little bit to give you that sun protection. So if you have concerns about things that are absorbed into the skin, a mineral sunscreen is going to be a great choice for you. And that's really the reason that we like them for babies and children as well, is that there's limited absorption. Um, I have seen so many things on social media kind of questioning the safety of different sunscreen ingredients. And what we do know is that some chemical sunscreens, especially ones that contain things um, in the benzone family, so avobenzone, oxybenzone, um, can be estrogen mimickers to coral reefs. But unless you were a coral reef or coral reef adjacent, we think that they are very safe, um, especially for adults. So um, the, the relative risk of ultraviolet exposure versus the relative risk of using a chemical-based sunscreen, there is no question. It's absolutely safe to use. But again, if that is your concern, um, or certainly if you're going on a vacation where you may be in a more tropical part of the world, absolutely a uh, uh, physical sunscreen is fine. As far as looking at parameters for how to choose that sunscreen, whether you're looking in the mineral or the chemical family, there's a couple of things you need to consider. The first is looking in the SPF range of 30 to 50. SPF numbers are really giving you the percentage of ultraviolet that's going to be blocked with perfect use. And as Dr. Hefner touched on, perfect use is really hard, especially for those of us with squirmy young kids. Perfect use means applying a golf ball size of product for each body area. For example, a golf ball to the face, a golf ball for the arms, a golf ball to each leg, a golf ball to the chest and back. That's a whole tube of sunscreen and you're supposed to reapply every 90 minutes. So is perfect use really possible? That is debatable, but we sure try. Uh, but that's, those numbers are giving you your sun protection with perfect use. That being said, SPF 30 is going to block about 92% of ultraviolet rays. SPF 50 is gonna block about 98% of ultraviolet rays. Is the difference between 92 and 98 worth it to move up to SPF 50? In my opinion, yes. Now the difference between 98 and 100, that may be an academic rounding error. So using SPFs higher than 50, unless you have a photosensitive condition and you've discussed this with your dermatologist, lupus, for example, we generally don't recommend investing in those higher numbers just because the bang for your buck probably isn't there. But shooting around an SPF 50, regardless of the type of sunscreen you choose, is a really good um, just kind of barometer to look for. And then remembering to reapply, remembering to use enough, and taking the assist where we can get it. The sun protective clothing, the hats, the shade structures, trying to avoid the sun to the greatest extent we can, does make that challenge of using enough sunscreen and often enough um, a little bit easier. We have a question from the chat about choosing the right sunscreen for your skin and based on the amount of sun exposure. It's not really based on the amount of sun exposure because the rules are the same. Whether you are driving in a car with a window or sitting at the beach, you want to make sure that you are all exposed areas are completely covered and the sun protection of your choice, SPF 50, applied in sufficient quantities, applied enough and reapplied every 90 minutes uh, to two hours. As far as your skin type, if you have more sensitive skin, then choosing a product that for babies or sensitive skin is a great choice. If you have skin that tends to be a little bit drier, choosing one that's more moisturizing, often the sport-based formulas are a little bit more hydrating and emollient is a good choice for you. But as long as the numbers are working out, we are happy. The reason that there's aisles and aisles and aisles of these products to choose from at every store is that really everybody's preferences are different and the best sunscreen is one you're actually going to wear. 100%. Um, 
since we're talking a little bit about things that affect us in summer, they, of course, all year round, you have to wear your sunscreen all year round, but we start kind of bringing it to the front of our mind in the summer when we're going on vacation and visiting the pool. Another question that we get often um, is about ingrown hairs, razor burns, nicks while shaving, ways to basically safely remove hair. Um, Dr. Goldberg, can you talk to us a little bit about um, your tips for minimizing ingrown hairs and um, safe methods of hair removal? Yeah, sure. So there are, just like there are different types of sunscreen and you pick the one that works best for you, same thing with hair removal techniques. Some people prefer um, to leave the hair alone. Some people prefer to use shaving or waxing or um, depilatory creams that you can actually apply to the skin. So you want to um, try different methods if you're interested in hair removal and see the one that works best for your skin type. If you are going to be using one of the more popular techniques like shaving, it is best to um, do that in the shower with lukewarm water um, using a protectant on the skin um, so that your skin stays hydrated and moisturized. And then when you get out of the shower after you've shaved or waxed, moisturizing the skin is important. And I'll have to say that just over and over again, just making sure you moisturize the skin because dry skin, you're going to be able to see a lot more redness um, and irritation. And so right when you get out of the shower, if you put on a nice fragrance-free moisturizer, you can oftentimes reduce uh, that irritation. Fantastic. Um, and kind of piggybacking on that, Let's talk a little bit about showering. Um, how often are we recommended to shower? Water temperature, morning versus evening, any special considerations in the summertime as far as our bathing routines? Sure. So just like we talked about for washing our face, everybody's a little bit different. If you have very dry skin or eczema prone skin, you do want to be cautious, not specifically for how often you shower, but for irritants that we use in the shower. We all tend to use soap in the shower and soap can dry out or irritate our skin. So if you have dry or sensitive skin and you want to shower every day, that's fine, but just limit how much soap you're using and the actual scrubbing of your skin. I always like to compare it to if you're washing a greasy pan. If you have a greasy dish and you're doing the dishes and you just put a little water on it and use your hands, you're not going to cut through the grease and the oils. You have to put soap on and you have to scrub. Well, our bodies have natural oils, natural moisturizers. So if you're pouring soap on your body and you're using a loofah and scrub, scrub, scrubbing for that squeaky clean, we're stripping away a lot of our natural oils and we're gonna dry out our skin. So if you are you know, young and have oily skin, you can probably tolerate that. Um, as you get older, or if you have sensitive or eczema prone skin, you're not gonna wanna do that exfoliating, scrubbing, cleaning every day. We recommend using your hands, using lukewarm water, and using a gentle fragrance-free cleanser to wash your skin. And then, like I think we've mentioned before, as soon as you get out of the shower, you want to trap in that moisturizer, rehydrate the skin, and you want to put on a moisturizer. Um, I think we could talk a little bit about moisturizers um, if we have time to do that. But general, the greasier is the better. So if you can tolerate something thick and greasy, ointment and texture, like plain petroleum jelly, that's the best thing to do after you shower. If that makes you feel a little bit greasy, then using a thick, white, fragrance-free cream to seal in that hydration um, is going to be best. Absolutely. I am... Um often tell my patients bathing can be a problem or an opportunity, depending on how we do it. And I think you highlighted that beautifully. So we want to avoid um, traumatizing the skin, anything harsh, anything scrubby, anything that's going to disrupt that barrier. And if we, as soon as we get out of the bath or shower, we pick our favorite moisturizer. If you um, follow skincare influencers on social media channels, they often refer to this as slugging when you take a lighter moisturizer and you apply that first, and then you take a thicker, heavier, greasier moisturizer, um, like a petrolatum product, and you apply that second. Um, we'll talk about in a minute, all of my many concerns with the skincare advice that's disseminated through social media channels. Um, but this is one that I actually love. I think slugging is a great idea because it allows you to kind of block in 
skin that lighter layer with a heavier layer and really take advantage of um, the moisture that we put into our skin, despite the fact that we're removing some of our natural oils with bathing, it does offer us an opportunity to get some really nice absorption of great emollient products, which is wonderful no matter what your age, no matter what your skin type. It really sets a wonderful foundation for your skin. Um, and as far as, you know, summer considerations, if you're going to be swimming or exercising or um, doing anything that keeps you outdoors for a long period of time, your products are going to be piling up on each other, especially if you exercise, you may notice them start to pill or if you're in a pool, really good idea to take a quick shower afterwards if you can, rather than waiting till nighttime and then remembering the importance of moisturizing afterwards if you're showering maybe a little bit more frequently than you do in the winter time. Um, it looks like we have a few minutes here, so I'm going to just take a quick minute to talk about one of my favorite subjects, myth-busting skincare advice that comes from social media. And I realize the irony of discussing this as we are talking to you through Facebook Live. However, uh, we are three board-certified dermatologists who spend um, our lives and all of our uh, passionate expertise educating people about the right way to care for their hair, skin, and nails. Please remember that not all social media is coming to you from board certified dermatologists. Many of the pieces of information that are coming to you on Instagram, TikTok, and beyond are coming from people who want to sell you something. So if somebody is telling you that they took this vitamin and all of a sudden their hair looked fabulous, or they bought this 17 step, very complicated skincare routine and all of a sudden their skin was glowing and beautiful, it is very possible that that 20 year old would have had glowing beautiful skin and really thick lustrous hair regardless of what they recommended to you. So please take everything you see on social media with a grain of salt. Same goes with trends. They're not all bad. As I said, the, the term slugging, I actually love it. I think it's been really helpful, especially for a lot of my teenage acne patients to think about how to layer your products for the best benefit. But then there are other myths that are perpetuated, such as it's a bad idea to wash your hair and you should go five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days without washing your hair. Um, you shouldn't. That is not a good idea. The skin of your scalp is skin, just like the remainder of your body. And if you have dry or textured hair, as I have dry textured hair, sometimes it can be difficult to balance the needs of the ends of your hair with the needs of the skin of your scalp, especially in the summertime. Um, so what I often recommend to patients who have a hard time with washing the ends of their textured hair as frequently as you need to, to keep your scalp in a healthy balance, is think about only using shampoo on your roots. So give it a good scrub into the scalp, starting an inch down from your roots. You can use just the conditioner of your choice. You don't need to use shampoo at all. And you can let that kind of sit together for five to 10 minutes and then rinse it out together. And we should really be shooting for if you have uh, finer hair that will accept more frequent washing every other day to a maximum of every third day to cleanse that scalp, to remove any dirt, debris, um, dead skin cells, skin oils that build up and can congest those follicles, lead to dandruff or um, hair loss if they're not properly uh, cleansed on a regular schedule. If you have drier, more textured hair, um, you once a week is fine, but we should really uh, try to cleanse the scalp a minimum of once a week for um, optimum scalp health. Again, the ends of the hair, totally different set of rules. They don't need to be refreshed anywhere near as often, but the skin of the scalp for maximum hair growth, hair health, especially in the summertime where our products do tend to build up, um, important to wash regularly, no matter what TikTok tells you. Um, and kind of to that end, don't forget that your part line is heavily exposed. So to make sure your sunscreen are wearing hats on your part line as well. And for those friends of ours whose hair has started to take its leave, even more important to remember not to neglect the scalp when we're thinking about our sun protection. Um, okay, now I know that sometimes these panels answer a lot of wonderful questions, but they also generate a lot of follow-up questions, and that's a good thing. We want to kind of stimulate this discussion and talk to each and every one of you about how to optimize your skin health. Um, so to that end, we kind of want to talk about how often you should be seeing your dermatologist um, for as, as we move throughout our life. Dr. Hefner, can you tell us a little bit about your recommended schedule for visiting your dermatologist? Yeah, so um, it all depends on your concern. Um, so if you, it varies, there's for skin screenings, there's no clear guidelines. So um, what I tell my patients 
Um, a yearly skin check is fine. We're happy to see you in the office. Is it truly necessary to come every year for a lot of people? No. If you have a strong family history of melanoma, then yes, please come in once a year uh, for your skin screening. If you have a lot of risk factors, if you've used a lot of tanning beds, if you've had a lot of blistering sunburns, if you have a lot of weird looking moles, also you should be seeing us once a year. Uh, for other patients, um, you know, it, it, it varies. Um, if, it, if it makes you feel more comfortable to come in once a year, then we are, again, we're happy to see you. Um, if you see anything that is changing on your skin, that's bleeding easily, not healing, come in sooner. Um, and, you know, make sure you're wearing your sunscreen too. So, um, I, it, the, it's not a clear answer. Um, so, so the answer varies. Um, but generally, um, for our high risk patients, once a year, we want to see you here. For some people that have precancers, um, sometimes twice a year, every six months. If you have other concerns such as acne, psoriasis, um, ideally at least once per year to see us. Um, and if you're ever in doubt, ask us, you know, ask your dermatologist, how often should I be seen in the office? Because, you know, it depends. It depends on what we see on your skin when, when you're here. Absolutely. Um, and before we move to our closing thoughts, I will just touch on um, sometimes I think one of the most challenging and often frustrating things is the line between medical and cosmetic dermatology. Because in the insurance world, sometimes we think of it as this harsh line, this is medical, this is cosmetic, but we know it's, it's really sometimes doesn't feel that way. It's that they're all kind of interconnected. And so much of what we do in dermatology is about the way our skin looks, um, not just the way our skin feels. Um, so please feel free to reach out to your dermatologist if you have questions and they are cosmetic in nature. While our cosmetic derm practice here at Kaiser uh, Permanente's paused services at the moment, we're hopeful to reopen it shortly and we can help get you linked up with our community partners who do provide these services. So for example, we had a question in the chat about melasma. We can certainly give you guidance about great ways to kind of mitigate your risk factors and some topical things to try if it goes beyond that and you um, are are interested in looking into procedures like a chemical peel or a microneedling treatment. Just because we may not have um, the tools to do that in our medical offices does not mean that those tools don't exist and we can help guide you to the right place to get that care. Um, it looks like we are running a little bit short on time here, but I wanna make sure that each of my fabulous partners has, some chance, uh, has a chance to share their closing thoughts. Uh, let's start with you, Dr. Goldberg. Any closing thoughts to share with our members? Um, I, I just want to loop back to the melasma question really quickly because we talked briefly about um, mineral sunscreens and how helpful mineral sunscreens can be reflecting the sun and working immediately. These are your zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. A lot of people shied away from those products, though, um, because they left that kind of white sheen on the skin. And I think one of the um, newest newest um, things that has come out on the market is tinting these mineral sunscreens, especially for the face, especially for really for anybody. But if you have a tendency towards melasma or hyperpigmentation, you can get that great mineral sunscreen and it's tinted. So it doesn't leave that white sheen. You're getting all the benefits of a strong, um, good mineral sunscreen, and it even blends in the skin tone. So that's been one of my favorite newer products over the past couple of years. And brand, so many brands have made a tinted mineral sunscreen just even in the past year. Check your local check your local drugstore to find one um, that you like the look and the feel and the smell of. Um, the last thing I'll refer you to is the American Academy of Dermatology's website. They have a skincare tip sheet for all basic skincare needs, acne prone skin, oily skin, infants, babies with eczema. They have um, videos and they have board certified dermatologist tips and tricks for almost any skincare basic need. So that's an excellent place to start when we're talking about looking up things and social media. Um, it's a very credible source. So the American Academy of Dermatology basic skincare tips. Absolutely. I love both of those tips. Those mineral sunscreens are absolutely fabulous. And uh, the AAD, the American Academy of Dermatology's website is truly a wealth of 
um, really wonderfully vetted information and great knowledge. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. Dr. Hefner. Oh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me on this discussion today. I think we had a lot of fun discussing you know, the things that we run into daily in our practices. Um, we you know, want your skin to be as healthy as possible. So, um, you know, making sure you're doing those lifestyle changes um, to get your best skin. Um, if you ever have any questions, um, you know, you can reach out to your dermatologist or to one of us. Um, we're happy to answer those. Um, and we're paying more attention to our skin during the summer. So, um, you know, watch out for all those mosquito bites that you know are coming. Um, you know, enjoy your beach vacations. Just make sure you have your sunscreen on. Um, I think that's all I would have to say. Fantastic. And that's a great point, Dr. Hefner. I know there are so many other um, skincare concerns that are present all year round, but maybe you're a little bit more in our focus in the summertime, like bug bites and poison ivy. Um, and if there's interest, we'll work on doing another chat, kind of talking about those specific little annoying nuisances that can detract from our summer fun. One of my favorite things about practicing at um, Permanente Medicine is working with these fabulous colleagues. Dr. Goldberg, Dr. Hefner, thank you so much for um, taking the time to share your expertise with us this morning. It is just such a joy and a pleasure to be on your team. And for all of you watching, thank you so much for tuning into our Facebook Live event. If you enjoyed this or you're looking for other health information like this, visit kp.org slash doctor. For all of us at Kaiser Permanente, please be well. Have a wonderful summer and wear your sunscreen. Bye. Thank you.